So, Bob, I sent out a survey for people to fill out and submit questions for you. And we got a lot of questions from the patrons and the YouTube members. So let's answer those questions or let's have you answer the questions. What do you say? Sure. Yep. Patron Jessica asked, what is the most meaningful lesson you've learned from a client? Okay. Full confession. I read this question before I got here. Yeah. I so, sent you all the questions. Yep, you did. I got through many of them, but not all of them. Yeah. So uh, I had to think for a while, and then I realized it was a student of mine who in um, uh, in my DBT group class, whatever. And I remember I talking about um, I was I, I don't know why, but I was talking about um, people that are panhandling and how it isn't a good idea to give somebody money because they they're apt to use it for alcohol or drugs. And uh, one of my students challenged me on that and said, "Well, you know, so what if that's what they do?" And I'm like, "Well, I don't want to contribute to." somebody suffering or somebody's you know addiction or whatever and she's like maybe that's what's needed for someone to hit bottom and maybe it isn't for you to say you know maybe you can't really know what what is helpful or not and i thought about it and it was really nice moment because i can say things with aggressive certainty and not really think about them i suppose anybody could do that but that was a moment when i was doing that and she said that thing to me and i took it in and i really chewed on it and um, that was a really important thing for me. It's changed the way I view um, folks who are panhandling. I feel less like constrained or um, anxious or ashamed or I don't, I don't really get irritated. I know some people get irritated when they see panhandlers. I don't get irritated. I just get anxious or ashamed. And now I don't. I just oftentimes I'll just give somebody some money um, because they need it because nobody that's panhandling is doing it because it's lucrative. They're doing it because it's perhaps the best choice available given life circumstance. And that is really quite something that. And I am blessed in some ways, materially blessed in some ways. And um, I feel good when I can contribute to somebody like that. That was really cool thing she taught me. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, when, when you thought about answering this question, because I thought about how I would answer, and I could not come up with an answer easily. Yeah. Because one, my memory isn't so great, yeah. and I lamented actually having a hard time recalling. I, I, it really dawned on me how many clients I don't remember. Oh, yeah. At, 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 we've both had long careers, yeah, and very. I feel like at a certain point when my brain memory of this category reaches a certain capacity it doesn't just stop recording or something i feel like there's a memory dump of some kind it's just like you've gone over your memory allowance and so i'm just going to purge like 70 percent of it because i feel like when i was younger when i had fewer clients but i remembered so much more about each of those clients yeah. i feel like i, I re reached this or when you reach capacity, it just blends all the memories together or something. I don't know. Well, and, and of course, getting older affects things and, 30 years. and time you know, fades things. But yeah. it just dawned on me how little I remembered. And, and it made me want to actually jot a bunch of stuff down oh. and, and try to recall yeah. people, you know, so that I can remind myself of yeah. certain moments and, and important moments for mm -hmm. me. So... When I try to think of meaningful lessons that I've learned from a particular, because that's the way Jessica is asking it. It's not mm -hmm. like, what have you learned from working with clients? It's right. what has a client, a particular client taught you? Yeah. And I, I know there's got to be millions of things, but I couldn't think of like a, right. a, a poignant moment. Did you have that problem? Yeah. So I got out my accounting software and opened up the list of inactive clients and started scrolling through. Right. Most Names, I, I only got up to the C's. And then I remembered this client whose name does not begin with C. Um, but um, I got, I, I remembered a little bit of most clients, but not enough to really talk about. And in terms of something they might have taught me, I'm like, no, I don't think so. Nope, that doesn't ring a bell. Nope, that doesn't ring a bell. And then suddenly she flashed in my head and lovely, lovely young woman, really great to have as a student. And I'm great, grateful to her for what she taught me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the only thing that I could think of to say would be that vulnerability is the road to happiness in general yeah. that a lot of clients have taught me that right because <laughs> i've seen it so many times right so 
all right, well, let's take a break. We get back. Let's get to more of these questions. What do you say? Yes. All right, Bob, let's do an OPP. So when I say OPP, you have to say OPP, like the way that Birdo does. OPP. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, that's like the song. Okay, so these patrons became patrons in 2021 and have stayed patrons ever since. We have Katrina. All these folks didn't have, didn't list where they were from. Oh. So these are all people from God knows where. We have Katrina, uh, Niam, we have Tamaris, Mitzi, Lauren, Mark, Valerie, Nate, Monica, Tessa, Katrina, Maurice, Victoria, Miranda, Stephanie, Emily, Ciara, Yasmin, Alejandro. Wait, Alejandro? Is that, is, do I know Alejandro? Uh, Camilla, Ashley, uh, Stephanie, Dunk, Nicole, Emily, another Emily, Caroline, Carolyn, James, SC, Mari. Do I know you, Mari? Maggie and Erica. You all became patrons, and you are all from God knows where. So I feel like if you have a common name, you wouldn't necessarily know if I was talking about you or not. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, on Patreon, you have to opt in to have your address available to us. And you can just enter in your city if you don't want to have your full address. But if you're an upper tier patron, then... If we don't have your address, Stacy, my wife, can't send you merch. You have to actually have your address listed for us. And uh, we will never send you spam or we're not coming to your front door and like knocking on it or anything. No, nothing like that. It was, <laughs> it's the only reason is either for us to uh, say Erica from Auckland or whatever, right. or if we were to send you merch. Um, anonymous patron wrote in, Bob, you have been open in this podcast about your own personal struggles. Has that ever been met with judgment from others, lay people or clinicians? If so, how do you handle it? So just chime in here. This is a great question mm. that anonymous patron wrote in because you are very open about your personal struggles on this podcast. Yeah. I can't imagine lay people necessarily judging you as a clinician, but I could imagine clinicians absolutely judging. I can't, I mean, I, I haven't heard it to you, but I've heard people say things like it's unprofessional because they'll say that stuff about me. Uh, What's unprofessional about that? I can't think of anything in the least that's unprofessional about that. Well, I'm trying to put myself in their mindset. Okay. I mean, one, it's any time in our field, any of us do anything that is Un, non-traditional, mm -hmm. like having a podcast, <laughs> then there's always a general okay. knee-jerk reaction okay. of it's unseemly, it's embarrassing, it's unprofessional, yeah. it's money-grubbing. Mm. Like the new sort of scapegoat is any therapist on TikTok, because there's a lot of really shitty clinicians on TikTok, I'll oh. tell you, but there's also a lot of clinicians on TikTok that are doing good stuff. Oh. But there's a lot of people and you know, comments that will say any therapist on TikTok is is a bullshit artist or is unethical or something that you're just like, huh? So anyway, you don't have an ethical duty when you're not, when you're not providing therapy. That's not true. We do have a, an ethical responsibility for professionalism, even when we're off duty. Is that right? Yeah. Huh? I mean, it's because it's so gray and so culturally based. Yeah. Like with Jordan Peterson, for example, he is uh, the, the licensing board in Canada. Oh, came down on him because they're like, you can't attack that plus size woman with that tweet. That's unprofessional. He also was attacking Elliot Page, the trans man actor from the United States and, and the doctor calling the doctor that treated Elliot Page a criminal for using the standard of care of gender affirming oh uh, surgery. And so they told him that these particular tweets and some others are unprofessional. And as a consequence, to keep your license, you have to attend training on how to use social media as a clinician. That's oh. it. Just They didn't take his license away. They didn't suspend it. They just said, you have to attend a training. That's it. They didn't even tell me he has to change his behavior. No. They just said, you have to attend a training. That's it. Huh. And mm. of course, because he's him and all of his cult members are them, he took it uh, and ran with it as the Nazis and the fascists are trying to shut him up. Okay. And they're trying to lock him up in the jail of political correctness. And so he's digging his heels in. And so the licensing board is threatening to take his license away because he's not complying 
with a simple directive. So huh. these things he was saying were completely outside of work, so to speak. He's in his personal time tweeting about this. Yeah. And they're saying it's unprofessional, which, you know, uh, but even if you didn't have it under the, under the hmm. umbrella of professionalism, it's also under the umbrella of client care because if he has any trans clients or plus size clients or clients that struggle from body shame, then they are going to be harmed by not only those tweets potentially, but also that attitude that he has and any potential client coming to him. So, you know, yeah. there's, there's a lot yeah. of issues that he needs to um, change. So that's why, that's why professionalism does affect our, our, our off hours. Okay. I can understand that. And for a guy like doing shit like that, yeah, I think that that's, yeah, you had one of the most disgusted-looking faces as I was describing that. It's just, it's just unnecessary. It's just, I, I don't get it. It seems so self-serving that I, I can only imagine a person doing that because of its consequence for them. It puts money in his pocket or develops a listenership or whatever, and yeah. it's self-serving. But I can't imagine, I, I shouldn't say this, I don't know that this is true. I can imagine that being the the lion's share of why he would say such provocative things is because of the the uh, impact that it has on the people who actually listen to him, as opposed to he actually gives a shit about who's on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Right. Plus, the training would be what like three hours long yeah, and be useless. <laughs> yeah, but but that's all he had to do. Yeah, yeah. And presumably, he would learn maybe to not go that far hopefully maybe, in yeah. his tweets and maybe if he did it again there would be maybe maybe two days of training with yeah. maybe a little bit of supervision or something and he because of his pride or his brand he he won't submit to that right got it and and the problem is bob yeah is all of his cult members of course are totally in the bag for him oh sure but a lot of clinicians because they don't understand ethics uh, are also oh. publicly on youtube yeah i won't name names <laughs> Yeah. Some of you might know these individuals out there yeah. who are publicly on YouTube claiming that the licensing board is going too far because they can't, uh, because the, what they claim is it's freedom of speech, which is, inter it's, which is interesting because it's in Canada. They have a completely different system of rights there that, yeah, right, that right. aren't, that's, the, 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 yeah. plus the freedom of speech does not mean you can attack people and harm them through your speech. You know, you don't have the right to say anything. Plus, That's true. that is not the issue at hand. The issue at hand is he is a licensed clinician, and the right. government is giving him a license to treat the citizens. The reason why we have licensing boards is not because the government just wants to do it. It's because the, the customer base, the people, the citizenry, begged the government to please regulate this situation so that customers can have at least some level of assurance that this individual has passed through a set of requirements yeah. to demonstrate that they are, at least are more likely to be helpful and not harmful. Sure. If you have a completely unregulated system, then you get coaching. What we have an unregulated system. It's called coaching. You can be a third grader and be a coach. Yeah. You can hang a shingle as a third grader and say, I am a life coach. You could be a serial killer. You could be a terrible human being, a, a, yeah. a, a charlatan, just an awful human being, yeah. and mm -hmm. call yourself a life coach. Yeah. And yet at the other end of the spectrum, you have life coaches that go through a lot of training, a lot oh, of sure. ethics, and are good yeah. at what they do. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. So uh, as a customer, how would you know that? Well, that's the way counseling and therapy used to be. We begged the government, please regulate this so that us as a profession and the customer can be uh, have some level of safety. So for the therapists to say that this is about free speech, you're basically saying there should be no regulation on the safety for the clients. And that that's the problem, yeah, yeah. Bob. You know, right. if every therapist right. agreed, no, 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 no. Jordan Peterson, no, no, no. But a lot of vocal charismatic therapists on YouTube are agreeing with jordan peterson and they're saying i don't agree with what he says but i do agree with his freedom of speech and i'm like dudes <laughs> you don't understand what the fuck is happening he's standing behind his uh background and training and education and license he's standing behind that while he makes such harmful and shitty com comments yeah i'd say the difference between him and me is i only talk about me Right. So what people would claim about you, I'm just trying to put myself in their shoes. Sure. Well, I suppose the one thing that I, I, I would, that we have talked about, and I know you think about, is your clients listen to this podcast. Yep. 
Some of them do. Some. And if they hear you talking about your own traumas, um, of course, we understand there's a benefit to that, <laughs> right? Of vulnerability and humanizing and leading by example. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of good that a client could get, but there might be a bad where they are yes. less sure about your authority as a clinician. Right. We have considered it and you consider it, right? I do. And there are many things that you would not say or do on the podcast. You know, there are a lot of things we talk about off off microphone yeah. that well, you would never talk about on the podcast yes. that are in a different level or a different area of personal talk. Yeah. So I, there is a concern about that. But that's what people would say about professionalism mm -hmm. and, and client care. And Well, I, I can actually see the point to that. And I have chosen to do what I do here because of what I hope is the benefit that it could provide, particularly to somebody who doesn't have access to therapy. And I wish to be a model for that. And I recognize that that could have an impact on some of my clients should they have found me through the podcast or happen to come across me um, while we were working together. But I'd, I'd like to think that nothing I say, well, I don't believe that anything I say here, hmm, Actually, I can't say that. I don't know that um, I wouldn't have a negative impact. I don't think I will. I wouldn't do it if I, if I felt sure of that. But I don't think that anything I do is likely to have a negative impact on somebody. It may be something that comes up in our efforts together. Most welcome to come up. And I am prepared to be, I'm prepared to receive whatever feedback needs to come my way as a result of the impact I've made on somebody as you know, if they found me or listened to something, you know, that I said on the podcast and had, you know, maybe it scared them or, or, had, you know, whatever, um, or undermined their confidence in my capacity to provide decent, decent therapy. Yeah, that would suck. It would suck, but I would definitely talk about that with them. And I guess these things are not black and white and I am comfortable enough with that possibility. And I think there's a lot of internalized oppression and shame around emotions and vulnerability in general. Yeah, what are we really talking about here? Right. Well, what do you think? I think that's what we're really talking about. How so? Most of the feedback I get from people about the way in which I talk about myself here is, I'm glad somebody said it. I feel this way. I thought I was the only one. It's really quite heartbreaking when you think about it. Um, and what I think is, we're all turkeys in the same turkey soup. I'm not really saying anything that many, 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 many people wouldn't relate to um, or understand. But it, I, I do say things here that, that I think other people are afraid to reveal about themselves. Uh -huh. But that and that might come up, and somebody might be angry with me simply because it it's close to home for them. Okay, fine. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it till just now. It's a form of activism. Yes, to stand up and say we exist. We all, and usually activism is is you know, standing up for an oppressed group, but we all are this oppressed group. We are. Maybe around the globe in every society. <laughs> At least I have yet to learn of a society that doesn't oppress their people yeah. in this way. So right. I, I don't know, but you know, it's activism for every human. Yeah. I guess climate change activism is a is an activism for every human yeah. and every animal. <laughs> Um, right. But it's interesting to think about, right? Yeah. Now, all that said, I am concerned about my siblings. I don't know that they listen to me on this, and I don't know that the things that I say wouldn't bother them to hear, because I've been frank about um, the abuse that I suffered, and of course, that, you know, they suffered as well. I don't want to talk about them, because that's none of my business, but, you know, we all, we all survived that. And I'm concerned that they might be upset with me for either airing dirty laundry, which I could see the I could see that, um, or um, might not have the same point of view as me about what happened, you know, because it is a fact that everybody grow up in a household has different experience of the family. So the experience that I have is different from the experience that my sibs have, and sometimes I wonder if they would be bothered. They haven't said anything to me, and I don't think. They listen to this very often, though I think my sister has on occasion. But I don't know. And did she say anything? No, never. Would she say anything? 
I don't think so. Even if she had something to say, I think it'd be very hard for her. Well, you never talk shit about your siblings. Oh, no, I wouldn't dare. And plus, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> my, my siblings are really lovely. They are just so lovely. When my father, I said this before, when my father passed, it was quite something to be there uh, with them. They were very supportive of one another. There was none of that infighting that you can find in families, scrabbling over money or anything weird like that. And they were just um, the model of kindness toward one another and me. And uh, I hope I returned the same. I think I did. Really lovely. I, I thought, I really like them. Mm-hmm. They're really, really cool. Yeah. All of them. I think my brother Pete is probably the nicest person I ever met. Yeah. Yeah. Just just a really good, decent guy. Yeah. I think I know that more easily than he does. It makes you cry to think about their goodness and yeah, maybe they're... what they've been through. And in spite of that, they're still good. That's nicely put. They are. They're really, really lovely. All of them. Each of them. Yeah. And I'm blessed. I get to see them in a month and a half. We'll be going uh, over Thanksgiving. We'll be going there to see them. So that'll be, I'm looking forward to that. That'll be fun. Yeah. So anyways, um, I have that concern. But other than that, I read that question before I came here. and We should finish it off, of course. But my, that's it, as far as I know, is what am my worries about uh, what might become of this. Oh, I did have something more to say. But we should we should keep reading the email because I think it comes further along. Oh. I am in grad school to become a psychologist. Well, let's take a break. Can we get back? Let's do the rest of it. What do you say? Yeah. All right. Going back on with the email from an honest patron. I am in grad school to become a psychologist and have experienced several massively impactful traumatic events. I have spent decades in therapy and feel I am well through my healing journey. While I am careful about it or what I might choose to disclose around friends and family, I am regularly coming across this idea that psychologists should have it all together. Mm. Thank you, Bob. You are amazing. Smiley face. So thoughts mm. about that. Thank you. It's a lovely email. I appreciate that I add something to your life. Um, I, I thought about this before I came over, and what I think is the following. You, like me and most anybody, carry your own vulnerabilities and raw spots. And if you're going to be a therapist... I do believe you have an ethical and personal responsibility to look after those so that they do not distort your countertransference or you minimize the, the way that that could happen. So you have an ethical and moral responsibility to get good supervision and consultation for maybe the first, I was thinking maybe the first 15 or 20 years of your career while you learn yourself. And by the way, it's not like that ever ends. I was having um, dinner with my best friend, Kirk, here about, I don't know, four or five months ago, and he said something to me that really, I still, that it stays with me. And I'm not going to repeat it, but it was instrumental to my... Why wouldn't you repeat it? Is it too personal? Yes. This okay. one this one is too personal. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll tell you if, later if you like. But um, um, so anyways, always learning, of course, but um, the first 15 years are developmentally like you want to you want to get yourself figured out enough so that your raw spots do not spill and when they do um, to practice humility and accept the feedback that you get not necessarily believe everything you hear but accept that this is indeed the impact that you're having or have had and um, respond accordingly mm-hmm. so I don't think that means you have to have your shit together. We are all turkeys in the same turkey soup. <laughs> yeah, I don't know a single human being that has their quote unquote shit together. There's just people that know about it and people that don't. Yeah, uh, I've never met anyone that didn't have a lot of or significant amounts of relational trauma. I don't, I don't know a single person that is constantly operating from a securely no, attached that's place. That's just silliness. Yeah, I don't know a single person who is aware of even half. That the, the most self aware person is only aware of maybe half of their issues you know and i don't want to denigrate psychologists but Mm. (laughs) um i live and i straddle a lot of uh, professions that's true as a professor and as a as a professional as well yeah because i'm both 
a marriage and family therapist, and I'm trained as a psychologist. I had just haven't taken the E triple P test. Uh, no. If I if I took the test, which you know is kind of a thing, then I would be licensed as a psychologist as well. So you know, but, I'm not technically a licensed psychologist, but you have a that that a, that level of education. And I'm also in that world, which is a, yeah. and they're very adamant in that world about identifying as a psychologist. Oh, yes, they are. And I, I would have fights with my authority figures because they were trying to get me to identify as a psychologist only and not as a marriage and family therapist. And I'm just like, what is it to you? <laughs> What's the diff about how I identify? Like, what is the deal? And it, that's interesting. Yeah. It, uh, not everyone, of course, but no. it was uh, it was bothersome. Huh. And I also am in the world of mental health counseling because that's Indeed. the dominant profession in any United yeah. States city, at right. least outside of the east, you know, northeast. I think. But mm. also, I taught a lot of counselors at Antioch because we were a program. At least back then, we're no longer. By the way, no, really? it's completely segregated. I yeah. would have never met you. Yeah. Oh well, I'm, I'm glad I was there then. For psychologists in my anecdotal experience they tend to be more buttoned up about things and there's pros and cons to that the pro is that they're much more scientific and much more research base based mm -hmm. and are much quicker to uh, jump on their fellow clinicians if they're not following the science for example i went to a marriage and family therapy the the national convention the AAMFT national convention that was happening in milwaukee you did yeah, well, oh. this was eight years ago or oh, something. Cool. Uh, my university actually sent me to it oh. because they wanted me to learn about accreditation because I oh. was becoming program director and right. was going to be basically solely all by myself walking our mm. our, our program through reaccreditation. Which sure, that only took fifteen minutes. <sighs> And so I went to this, and at the keynote speaker was this, you know, charismatic TED Talk sort of woman therapist. And she was, her big thing was about the differences between millennials, Gen Z, and the boomers. And she was attributing personality traits to each group. And of course, it was appealing to the group because it was playing into stereotypes, and the vast majority of the audience were our age and older kind of a thing. And so the, the denigration if that's a word of millennials mm. wasn't underappreciated let's put it that way <laughs> and but i'm sitting there but i'm sitting in the audience and i'm like this is nonsense i've looked at the research regarding the personality differences between the generations and this is nonsense this is just her making shit up wow. and and it wasn't just played for laughs i mean it was played for laughs kind of but she, you know this was kind of her main point uh-huh and i i just thought oh you know, this is part of that 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 world yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that code shift for me, if you will, of just like when I'm around marriage and family therapists, you know, the the con to the marriage and family therapist is that. But there's a pro to it, which is that marriage and family therapists are much more relaxed when it comes to having your own problems and talking about them and yeah. much less policing of other therapists for having vulnerabilities. Yeah. I think counselors are probably yeah. similar. Yeah. Whereas psychologists, so on the on the pro side is you have a more adherence to science and more adherence to the literature and you know a lot more buttoned up but on the other side they are less open to vulnerability less in fact in the programs there's just a lot less talk about it i'm sure there are programs that allow that or have that but i never saw it you know what i mean so i'm just saying that for this person writing in, it's possible that your world actually would judge you, anonymous patron, if you were to oh, be more point. vocal about it. Not that they would be in the right, of course, but yeah. um, there might be there might be something to that. So I don't know. Good good feedback. Uh, patron Nina or Nina says, I mean, there's there's three ends. You know, N I N N A. That seems like it'd be Nina, right? It sounds like Nina to me. Yeah. Um, what are your best childhood memories? Oh, yeah. I thought about this, too. Um, my bike. I had this red banana seat bike with the big moose handle handlebars. This is back in the 70s. I lived on that thing. When I was in fourth or fifth grade, the pedal snapped, the right pedal snapped. So I had this little nub on that side. And I still lived on my bike. And I could sort of pedal it, you know, like kind of work that out but it what it did is it chewed a hole through my right sneaker all of my right shoes um such that you, you know my toes were saying hi to the world 
and my foot would slip off and so I would get a cut on my ankle in the same place repeatedly and that went on for I don't know many 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 months maybe maybe a couple of years oh my god yeah until I finally you know found eight dollars to buy a pedal and boy when I did it was like it was like a whole new bike it, well not even that it was like coming home because I lived on that thing I that bike and then my buddies I had some really good friends back then two Scots two Jims and a Mike <laughs> 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 and um and a bob and yeah, there was just yeah right yeah um uh vacations with my family um we used to go to new hampshire and my dad would ease up and we'd play uh cards in the evening and he'd make grasshoppers you know what a grasshopper is a drink yes it's creme de menthe which is a liqueur and then he'd mix it with cream so it looks like a like a powder green like a really light green thing and it's like a minty tastes like toothpaste really and a little bit of ice and that and he'd <laughs> pour, pour us each a grasshopper and we'd play hearts and uh, as a kid you'd drink yeah 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 yes well my people you know alcohol how, how what's your people what do you say my people irish catholic so how old would, would you have been 10 10 yeah i know i know could you i can't imagine my brother's kids <laughs> so were you buzzed yeah i mean at, i didn't know it but yeah at 10 yeah wow yeah trippy huh that is i don't think they do that now but this is back in the days when they let you loose at eight in the morning in the summertime and you show up at dinner well that i can relate to yeah but sure my family never drank my yeah. parents never drank. oh yeah we'd have a glass of wine uh on holidays like christmas christmas dinner We'd have a glass of wine. Um, but it's not like they'd say, here, have another. It was just one, right? But still. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. I mean, it's, it's kind of unusual. a trip to think, for me anyway, about yeah. catching a buzz at 10 and how yeah. strange that must have uh -huh. felt at that age and to know what that's like. And my parents weren't against drinking. No. They just didn't like to drink. They, yeah. oh. they still don't, you know? Oh, oh okay. Um, yeah. It's just a, it's interesting to think about. Yeah. 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 Um, I... it. It tasted like a like a minty milkshake is what it tasted like. And then he got into chartreuse. You know what that is? That's another kind of liqueur. I don't know what it's made from. And he'd give us a little sip of it every now and again. And I was always afraid of it because it burns, you know, like alcohol. So, um, uh, yeah, it's not like my parents gave me alcohol. This was like on vacation. Sure. And then like on holidays, we'd have a, one glass of wine with dinner with, you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, you hear about Europeans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is, yeah, very, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, so you know, those are really lovely memories. Yeah. I, I, it's interesting that Patron Nina asked this because we don't get a chance to talk about it. Yeah, we don't. It's People, all about the bad things. Yeah, if anybody asks me, it's like, what, what, what's the shit that you went through, right? Yeah. 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 I had a, a similar bike, banana seat. Bike. Oh, I love that thing. And because uh, we were... I guess on the poorer side, my dad, my parents could never afford to buy me a new bike. So mm -hmm. I, what my dad would do is he would spend a little bit of money and he would renovate this really old Schwinn from like the sixties that weighed oh. uh, the, the frame oh. just weighed. It was pure steel, steel, but it looked cool because uh -huh. he painted it and then he put on a banana seat and then those, yeah. those sort of BMX handlebars. Oh, I didn't have those, but I'm with you. And better tires, yeah, yeah. knobby tires. Oh, like yeah, I, I didn't have that either. And I, yeah, I, me and my friends, my yeah. friends were Steve, Tom, and Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have two Scots and, and two mics. Two gyms and a mic. Oh, yeah. two gyms and a mic. Uh, and we would just ride all over. It, well, what started was with big wheels. Do you remember big wheel? Oh, sure. My brother used to get those. So the four of us had big wheels, and we would ride those so all over the neighborhood. Fun. And then I got a green machine. Oh, my God. My brother had to. I rode on a green machine about 10 years ago. First off, it can't hold my weight, <laughs> and it's too small, but it had the sticks yeah. instead, of a, instead of the handles. Yeah. Oh, so cool, you lucky duck. But it was kind of unwieldy. Really? You know? Well, because with a big wheel... For those who don't know, a big wheel, it's sort of like a fancy trike yeah. that's made out of hard plastic. Hard plastic. And it kind of so looks like low. a like a little motorcycle looking thing. And yeah. it's it's for kids, like six yeah. six year old kids, seven yeah. year old kids. But at the time, since these big wheels, they call them, were so popular, someone came out with this thing called a green machine. Green machine. And it was mm. like this advanced big wheel. Uh-huh. 
and the commercials made it just look like amazing. Yeah. And it didn't have a steering wheel. It had these two levers, levers. that you used to, I, th I think you turned the back wheels, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember. Um, that makes sense though, because you have to, the pedal. Right. Yeah. Right. On, the bit, on, on the front wheel, right? Right. Yeah. Because with big wheel, you would pedal, but the whole, you would pedal a wheel that moved. Yeah. Yeah. That it turned. Would turn, right. Yeah. yeah. And then we advanced to bikes. These are not rubber wheels. These are plastic wheels. Yeah. <laughs> And then we advanced to uh, bicycles, bicycles yeah. and then we would ride those around and right. then, then BMX style bikes were coming out. And so I had to follow the trends and, right. and I think there were two different iterations of in your neighborhood. Was it flat? No, hilly. Oh, really? Yeah. Cause when I think about that area of the world, I think of more flat than Seattle. Ah, uh, more flat than Seattle. It's comparable. Um, is it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Cause yeah. Uh, I, I envy people that grow up in areas like, you know, they talk about how in you know, cities in Europe, how there's all these, this bicycle culture. Right. And Seattle would absolutely, if we could be a bicycle city, because yeah. there's a lot of bicycle people and a lot of right. environmental conscious people. And yet it's so hilly <laughs> and it's not just uh -huh. one hill it's hill and then up and then down oh, and it's then, hilly yeah. and it's wet and you know, there are train tracks and right. even in a safe bike lane you know, there's a fair amount of really great bike lanes downtown and right but if you're flat or relatively flat like if you're in amsterdam or something you're just strolling down the road right but in seattle it's like you're either just ripping down a hill or right. you're just struggling as you're getting up right. a hill you know what i mean Anyway. Well, now they have these electric bicycles. You ever use yeah. one of those? Yeah, I did. Is it good? Uh, 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 yeah. Cool. But it's still extremely perilous because oh, uh -huh. one, cars can still hit you, obviously. Oh, yeah. And two, these electric bikes are heavy. They're basically like mini motorcycles because yeah. they have a lot of weight, the battery. Oh, and I the, didn't know and that. The motor. Yeah. yeah. Or at least the ones I've the seen. Ones you've, yeah, yeah. Question. Patron Miriam says, hi, Kirk and Bob. Thank you so much for all you do. I am in Israel, and there is a war now. Listening to you two is one of the only things that lowers my stress. I wanted to ask, what do you think makes a group of people do horrible acts while at war, like in Israel right now, and Gaza? Things that I am sure they wouldn't do in regular times. Acts like crimes against humanity. She, she lists a bunch of really horrific things that are happening. Mm -hmm that I won't read out loud okay. because we don't need to, but um, but we all understand yeah. that there's really horrible things happening to not only adults, but also children. Right. I am sure that hundreds of people didn't just become psychopaths overnight. Mm -hmm. This must be something with group rage, but what? How do normal people become like this? Bob, what do you think? Well, I there's probably a lot of literature about this that I couldn't speak to because I don't really know. Um, there's the Stanley Milgram studies. Remember those? Milgram's 37. That was a Peter Gabriel song, right? Um, and the research was, would, would the, basically the conclusion was, if somebody in authority tells you to do the thing and says essentially by their doing it that it is okay, you can end up um, skipping right through your morals and values simply because you bow to authority. So we are all capable of that. We're also all capable of cruelty. The little bit I know about what happens in Israel with Israel and Palestinians and the Muslim cultures around is um, that these folks have been um, angry with one another uh, for a long, long, long time and have probably suffered at one another's hands, either directly or indirectly, um, like, a, like, a, like an ongoing feud. That's a bit of a, probably a bit minimalistic, so I'm sorry about that. So I, I imagine if you've been hurt enough, you're, you could be motivated to do all kinds of things that you wouldn't otherwise do. So, um, and maybe we're talking about culture wide pain and fear and, um, um, a sense of not enoughness, not enough land, not enough resource, not enough, you know, money or, you know, whatever, uh, I can I can't I mean I can't imagine and um, though I'm reading all the same stuff in the news now and I'm very sorry about it I don't actually think any one person any one group can claim the moral high ground mm -hmm. oh God that's a 
there. We're going to get some feedback about that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm so sad for these individuals. You know, these are just people like you and me that are just trying to live their lives. Yeah. So what's the final word on uh, this episode, Bob? Well, I think hurt people hurt people. That's true. And um, I had something else I wanted to say, but just flew out of my head. I don't know. And I feel so lucky and happy and privileged to not have to personally in Seattle where I live. Yeah. yeah that I have to worry about these things. Yeah. I just feel so lucky I could, because I feel so bad for those folks. Yeah. I feel so bad hmm. for the people involved. The, the things that I, the video footage that I've seen, I just think as with Ukraine and Russia, I just, I just feel like, I don't know. It, it just, it just breaks my heart that we do this to each other. Yeah. This question should be, separated from politics and the question was why do why do people engage in violence and i suppose i'd like our response to that to be limited to the psychology involved to, to the degree that either of us knows anything about it and um to not have political um this is not a question for us about politics and that's part of what the trouble is is that that's part of the trouble with this question is, is because um, there is tremendous amount of pain and there's a great uh, association with politics and political view that it isn't a question about violence. It's, it can be a question about, well, somebody did something to me, so I'm doing something back or, you know, whatever. Um, I don't know. I think you probably edit all that out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Everyone out there, please, 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 please take care of yourself and take care of others. Why should they do that, Bob? Because you deserve it.